Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Thoughtful Tuesday. Let's begin our time together with some words of prayer. Gracious God and Father, we give you our thanks for this opportunity, for being together and for turning to your word and to have this, these few moments together. We pray, Father, that you'll open our hearts and minds to your word and that you will bless us as we study it together. Today, our hearts are heavy as we think of the families of those in Boulder, Colorado, who have been so tragically killed. And once again, we don't know what way to turn or what to think. It's another tragedy in our nation's history, another set of families left bereft and in shock. And we pray for your comfort and blessing for all those who have lost loved ones. Now, as we turn to your word, we pray for your help and for your guidance. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Some people have a wonderful way of approaching things in a totally different way, of seeing things from an unusual angle. And nobody was better at that than Winston Churchill. When he was 80 years old, the Conservative Party, of which he was the leader, and the Prime Minister wanted to have an official photograph of the great man taken for his 80th birthday. And so they hired a young society photographer to take his photograph. The young man showed up and he was very nervous in the presence of Churchill and was rather flummoxed by the whole thing. And hoping to please the old man, he said to him, I hope, sir, that I will have the great honour of photographing you again on your 90th birthday. Churchill, with a wry smile, looked him up and down and said, I don't see any reason why not. You look fairly healthy to me. Well, Churchill did manage to live to his over his 90th birthday, and there's no record if the young man did photograph him again. This morning, we turn to Mark's Gospel. And we're going to look at another example of one of the miracles of Jesus. It's found in Mark chapter 1. And we pick up the reading in verse 39 of the first chapter. Jesus went to, into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him and on his knees begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. And yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. But he was out in deserted places and people came to him from everywhere. In Jesus' day, leprosy was a truly awful, awful disease. It was probably the most feared disease of that day because it had no cure and you were left with no hope. It was a slow lingering death. And as bad as the physical conditions were, the mental and emotional strain of leprosy was perhaps just as bad because you had to leave your home, leave your family, leave your community, leave the town and village in which you lived. And you had to go out and live in the wilderness, staying far away from people, ringing a bell, yelling out to people to beware, to stay out of your way because you were a leper. It was an awful condition and it left people with no prospect of recovery. Now, here is this man who comes to Jesus and the amazing thing is that as weak as his body has begun to be, as this disease begins to take hold of his body, his faith is strong and vibrant and deep because he is convinced that Jesus can cure him the only thing that he's concerned about is if Jesus will cure him is Jesus willing he knows that Jesus is able he's absolutely confident of that but he wants to know is Jesus willing to do this now throughout the gospels 
we do find Jesus uh, healing pe some people from a distance. He isn't at their bedside. He isn't in the same house or room as they are, but he's able to give the word, speak the instruction, and their recovery begins from that moment. And Jesus is not even with them. So Jesus could have done this. He didn't have to do what he does next. Let's read it together. If you're willing, the leper says, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. We see in this not just the power of Jesus, but the sensitivity of Jesus. He is willing to do the unthinkable. He's willing to come into physical contact with someone who has leprosy. He's willing to embrace someone who could infect him. And not just physically, but this business put Jesus at danger of being ceremonially unclean. But again and again in the Gospels, we find Jesus ignoring the rules and regulations of men. The strict instructions, the built up uh, history that the Jews had of taking simple laws given by God and turning them into one rule and one regulation after another. But Jesus pays no attention to that. He knows that one of the things that's going to lift this man's spirit is the fact that Jesus is willing to embrace him. He's willing to do what no one else is willing to do. He's willing to come physically and touch him and make him clean. And Jesus restores him. The leprosy, it, we are told, left him right away and he becomes clean again. Now, Jesus sends him on his way to go to the priest. What was the purpose of that? Firstly, it was twofold. It was firstly to thank God. Moses had given some instructions as to what was to be offered to thank God, a sacrifice appropriate to thank God for a cure for leprosy, if there was one. And secondly, it also meant that he could have a certificate with a certificate from the priest testifying that he no longer was a leper, that he was clean and he was pure, he could go back home. He could go home to his wife and kiss her. He could hold his children. He could live in his community. That certificate was the open sesame for this man to a new and to a return to his life as it was before. It was a wonderful thing. And of course, he's so proud of Jesus and he's so excited that he tells everyone. He tells everyone he meets, which is quite against what Jesus had said and leaves it difficult for Jesus to move about the countryside because of the clamor of the crowd. The psalmist says in Psalm 103 that God pities his children like a father. And again and again in the Gospels, we come upon the compassion of Jesus, his willingness to approach things from a different angle, his willingness to do what others wouldn't dream of doing, his willingness to sit down with those who are the outcasts and at the bottom end of society's ladder, to just be with them, to show them compassion, to show that he cares, the prostitutes, the tax collectors and sinners, those who were the absolute dregs of society as far as people were concerned, were ordinary people to Jesus. And his compassion reaches out to them. Isn't that the appeal of Jesus? Isn't that the fact that he turns no one away? That they see something in this man. They see in the look on his face, the twinkling of those eyes. They see that compassion and they say to themselves, this man has only just met me, but I believe he cares about me. Sometimes the church conveys the image that it doesn't care, but the Christ of the church always cares and always has compassion for all of us, however far we stray, however deep we sink. May God add his blessing. Amen.